presentation, yep. Okay. Yep. So I, I have a background in optical fabrication since the early 70s. Um, I started working in Pittsburgh in, in 77. Um, and in 96, I, um, I came to work at the Stewart Observatory in Tucson, Arizona uh, at the mirror lab where they were making the mirrors. And this is a shot uh, of two of the mirrors uh, in 1999. The mirror in the background with the guy standing on it, I'm pretty sure is the back surface of LBT-1. And the mirror in the foreground, which is actually a polished mirror, that is the Magellan 1 six and a half meter mirror that's down in, uh, in, in Chile right now. Um, uh oh, why isn't it changing here? Oh, come on. There we go. At that time, uh, at the time I, I came into uh, uh, the business, why there were um, approximately three uh, technologies that would yield uh, mirrors uh, in the 8.8 meter class. Um, I'm talking about monolithic mirrors, that is uh, not including the segmented mirrors. Uh, in the early days, the computers weren't capable of doing that. But so the solution to, for an eight meter telescope was either the Corning ULE, um, uh, the Shad Zero Door, uh, Corning was used in Subaru and Gemini, the Shad Zero Door was used in the VLT in Chile, and the Stewart Observatory Mirror Lab uh, bore silicate honeycomb. Uh, had not yet, they had not yet made an 8.4 meter at that time. And that was the, that was their um, uh, central reason for existence. They were going to make 8.4 meters for the LBT uh, telescope. I don't quite know why this is not changing when I. Uh, <clears throat> I got a question right now. Okay, go ahead. Uh, 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 shot zero door. Is that what we would call a glass or is it a ceramic material or what? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which? <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's it's a it's a glass ceramic. It's it's made like like a borosilicate glass. It's got some aluminum in it, but then it goes. Well, I'll I'll go through that. I'll tell you that in the next slide, actually. Um, I mean, I mean, would you otherwise make pottery out of it? Uh, they make stove tops out of it. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah, they can make stove tops out of it. You can buy a stove with a zero door top on it. Uh, the ULE process uh, resembled the uh, uh, flame hydrolysis uh, process that was used to make fused silica at the time. In fact, it was the that time before ULE was uh, what they tried to make the hail mirror out of and, and weren't able to do it. Essentially, the uh, constituents are uh, sprayed into a, a hot furnace where the ro there's a rotating um, table below it and um, each uh, the, the stuff deposits over a period of time. If you wanted to make the, the, the usual size that you would get out of this process was around a meter and a half and about 100 millimeters thick, a rough, rough bool from which you would machine these hexagonal pieces that you can see in, in this picture right here. So if you wanted something bigger than a meter and a half across, you had to assemble it and fuse these pieces together. And then when you wanted to get some curvature into it, you put it on a, a, a mandrel such as this one and heated it up again and you sagged it. Uh, in the 8.2 meter class uh, in this picture is the Subaru uh, primary mirror. And this is in Wampum Mine in uh, Northern Pennsylvania. And, and here's a picture of the mirror coming up from, uh, from Corning up I-79 to, to uh, down actually to the Wampum, the Wampum facility. Oh, let's go back. Okay, the shot process uh, is a little different. It was uh, uh, mixed and then poured into a rotating uh, mold. The mold had a concave bottom to it. And so when you rotated the thing, the centrifugal force created the concave surface on the top. It then went through a number of steps, uh, one of the first of which was to machine the backside. And then it went through a serumization process and that process was fixed the, the coefficient of thermal expansion to near zero, and this this was done usually on mirrors this size. This was done after after the course, uh, the course machining, and then it was flipped over, and the work uh, was uh, it was fine and yield, and then it was uh, uh, processed, polished, just like like any other mirror. Here you can see 
a couple of technicians at Riosk in France that were doing the and doing the polishing. The Bohr silicon mirror idea did not originate with the mirror lab. As a matter of fact, it originated earlier than that, and notably with the Hale telescope, it was, which was made out of Corning Pyrex. Uh, it had a, a, a modest coefficient of thermal expansion, about three parts per million. It was a lightweight design. I think I calculated it was about 35% removed from it, what it would have been had it been a solid, it was 30, 35 or 40 percent. The, the advantage of the, um, uh, of the honeycomb structure increased the surface area dramatically and allowed air to circulate inside the mirror and, and equilibrate it. The way it was made was the glass was melted and then it was poured into a mold, uh, I believe it was called the beehive, and uh, from there uh, it was annealed and cooled, uh, ready for use. Somo uh, started doing the borosilicate castings in the early 80s and uh, typically started out small and, and gradually scaled up. This is a, uh, a record of the castings uh, at, at, at the mirror lab and the area that I've enclosed here in this box is the, is the area, is the time when I was there. Actually, I showed up in 96. At the time, they had uh, already cast the six and a half meter mirror for the multiple mirror telescope. Uh, that is, they took the six 72 inch mirrors that were in the multiple mirror, mirror telescope and replaced it with one six and a half meter mirror. Uh, the Magellan One mirror that, uh, I believe that's this one right here, was still in the casting area because they were in the process of polishing this guy when I, when I came in. And after that, uh, we went to the large binocular telescope um, um, another another six and a half meter for uh, Magellan two, and then we started doing the uh, the castings for um, uh, uh, well here's the binocular telescope the first one was actually in ninety seven in September of two, 2015 what was called the Stewart of Zuri Mirror Lab was rededicated as the Richard F Karras Mirror Lab Mr Karras was an engineer had a company called Interface and their business was to make force sensing apparatus. And we were buying lots of it, and he'd like to know why <laughs> until we, we finally told him, and he became very interested and actually um, uh, donated some money to, to the lab. Here's the overall process for making a borosilicate mirror. Um, the key thing here is that you make a mold with these pre machined cores, and here's a detail of what the core structure looks like uh, of the mirrors. This would be the bottom of the core, this is a tile, what I call a floor tile. And here it is again, this interface right here is the, is the bottom of the, of, will be the bottom of the mirror when it's finished. This is a core which is fixed to the uh, floor tile with a silicon carbide bolt set, um, and bolt and nut set rather. And then the, so this one has been cut. This is a cross section. You can see these are not normally exposed like this. And then the cores are attached to each other with uh, cross pins, and that serves to strengthen uh, the, the, the mold and you know, allow it to handle the forces that uh, it will see during, during the casting process. Here you see um, Randy Lutz loading the glass in, or well, part of it's already in there. Um, this is the way it's done. And then you bring the thing up to temperature in about uh, 40 or so hours, it reaches uh, uh, the casting temperature. The glass softens at around 850 C. Um, we took it to around 1200 C in order to get it uh, liquid enough to, uh, to fill the mold. And you can see that happening in, in this picture right here. Here's a view with a camera and this is all occurring while the thing is rotating. You can see it, you, now you see the core tops appear through the liquid glass and it's, it, you can see it when the thickness drops, when it fills the mold, you can see that it lightens up a little bit. Here's a little reference picture for scale. There's a guy in the middle of this. This is, uh, this is one of the mirrors uh, before it was removed from the hearth. <coughs> Oops, wrong way. Uh, just a point of reference, when I came to the mirror lab, this was the facility as it stood at that time. This is the Wildcats football stadium. Uh, uh, this is north, where uh, the parking lot is on the east side. Uh, this is where the furnace is located. 
Uh, this is uh, was a casting area where we did a lot of handling. This entire area was serviced by a 45-ton crane that traveled the entire length <coughs> of the casting area. There was a large roll-up door here, so to get things in and out into the polishing area, we moved them in through this roll-up door. This is the test tower. Over here was what we call the LOG. It stands for Large Optical Generator. It was originally the prop property of the Optical Sciences Center uh, on campus, and it was originally made to machine off-axis segments for uh, radio telescopes, uh, parabolic segments for radio telescopes. Uh, I'm not sure what it took to acquire it, but we eventually did. The first MMT six and a half meter mirror, in order to get that out of the building, we had to roll up this door right here and literally back a, a truck in to the building, and you gotta remember, this was kind of ramped down about three feet from the outside parking level. We moved it back the truck in all the way to the casting area and picked the mirror up and put it on it and then we drove it away. And we decided we're never gonna be able to do this if we're gonna make mirrors on any regular basis. And, and so we, whoops, and so we, I can't get it. And so we built a, an integration area on the outside. Now this was all enclosed, this area, and this was a door, access door, so we could go directly in here. This is all high bay area. There was another three segment door that you can see right here. And this was all out in the open air. This was a 55, serviced by a 55 ton crane. And when it came time to ship a mirror this time, we were able to back the truck right up onto this platform and put the mirror on the back and then drive away with it. And after that, when we started looking at making the giant Magellan telescope 8.4 meter segments, we realized that we weren't going to cut it with one polishing and machine and, and, and generating machine. Uh, we needed another one. And so we, we, we made, we contracted for this machine and uh, installed it. So the steps to making the, the mirror go like this. You start out with, a, you build a mold. This is the hearth. You can see the technicians are arranging those floor tiles on the, on the bottom. <clears throat> you, when you get the entire floor covered with these things, why you add the tub walls to the outside. I should say right here that um, this work that I'm describing took place, uh, what, 20 plus years ago. And I was the last person in Tucson to buy a cell phone. <laughs> and so I didn't have a lot of pictures, so I had to grab some of these from various times. And in order to illustrate the point I'm trying to make, I had to take pictures from different mirror projects. And this one happens to be a picture of one of the GMT segments. And since it's an off-axis parabola, there is no center hole in it. And so you don't see it. But this is what the tub wall looks like. And then this is the furnace wall uh, wrapping around it. And then you did a pre-fire at that point when you got the the, the tub made here, the lid goes on, and you, uh, you bring it up to temperature, and essentially all you're doing at this point is to cycle the materials. You bring it up to the full casting temperature, hold it there for a few hours, and bring it back down. Then when it's cool, you can open it up, and you can proceed with adding the cores themselves. And this this uh, picture actually is the LSST primary, and I know that because the, that mirror had a uh, had two curvatures in it and the center one was fairly deep and so you can see how thin the cores are in the center of the mirror. If you look at these you can see that the curvature is approximated by uh, machining the, the cores to length and then when they're bolted down why they get they, they get bolted in place. Here's that picture again where Randy's loading the glass in. Here's a shot of the thing uh, being pre-fired uh, or rather pre-fired after the mold making. And then here's a picture of the thing after it's been taken off the hearth and stood up. And the next step is to, um, to clean it out and uh, get, the, get the core material out of the, out of the inside of the mirror. Oops, I did not figure this out. So here again is a picture of the silicon carbide bolt and nut sets. This floor tile happens to be upside down in this picture. These are the surfaces which interface with the core, with the hearth itself. This is the top of the tile uh, with the hole in it. And as, you know, as the things get, after these things get placed in, you can see that the tub walls get set up uh, all the way around. Uh, here's a picture of the tub walls. Now this happens to be a six and a half mirror, meter mirror, but it's again, is the only picture that I could come up with that illustrates the point I want to make. You can see that the, this is essentially just a, a tub. And then it's wrapped with these Inconel bands. Uh, these bands uh, are 
wrapped around the uh, tub in 90 degree uh, sections. And at each corner, here, 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 and here, and here, there's a, a post that to which the ends of the bands are attached and they're tensioned with, uh, with pneumatic cylinders. Once the uh, tub is made and the bands are around the outside, uh, the furnace walls go on. And um, again, this is an eight meter mirror. You can see the difference in diameter in this picture. This one goes almost all the way out to the walls and this one it did not. And again, there's no center hole in this picture, but this is a picture that I was able to find that shows the tub made, the bands in, and the, and the, and the furnace walls in there. And after that gets done, the lid goes on and we go through that pre-fire uh, segment, which cycles the, the, what I call the hard refractories. These, <clears throat> these hard refractories are reusable. We would lose around 10% with each casting, but after uh, the casting, we were able to recover many of them and, and we low test them and, uh, before we use them a second time. The, the well, in the next picture you'll see it. The, um, um, the next section was to add the cores. And the first thing that we did was to line the tub, the floor, and the walls with the same white refractory material that the cores are made out of. You do not want the glass to come into contact with the silicon carbide bolts or the floor tiles or the wall tiles uh, because at uh, the high temperature it will react and it will foam. Uh, so the white stuff, the white refractory material, uh, does not react with the melted glass. And so uh, that's, you know, you, you, you cover the inside of the mold with that. These holes are the places where the cores will eventually be set. But the inside of the mold gets machined, as you see in this, in this picture right here, we're machining the wall. Oops, sorry. Oh, Steve. Okay. Machining the walls and the floor uh, in preparation for setting the cores in. Each core gets machined. They show up in a fairly coarse form. They are a hexagonal tube. Uh, this uh, bottom piece gets uh, bonded onto it and then um, they get machined. They get smoothed around the bottoms. The top gets cut to the relative height at, of the mirror at that size. Here you can see a cross section from the drawing and you can get an idea of what a, uh, you know, the way the, the mold is constructed. The thickness between the cores in the, the spaces uh, that you can see here is about a half an inch, and the distance across the cores is about, is about eight inches. In this picture, you can see uh, cores being set. Uh, there's a fairly uh, rigorous process. The, the bolt goes through the hole and it gets torqued to a, a, a prop, the, the torque we need to hold it in. Here you can see uh, uh, the holes for the cross pins. The guy will drop this in. The next thing that happens, next thing that happens is he uses a reamer. He, he reams the hole through to the next core. They, they, you can see this core cross pin is slightly tapered, and so it gets glued and shoved into the holes. And then, and finally, uh, a hexagonal top gets put on. So now you no longer have access to the inside, <clears throat> inside of the cores. Uh, here you can see a, a shot where the core structure has been partially assembled. There's a temporary floor put on so the guys can walk around on it. Um, um, and, and then, you know, eventually this, this will migrate itself all the way out. In this picture, you can see that almost all the cores are placed. Uh, and you can see, except the, you can see there's a very outer rim. The tops have not yet been put on there. But after they are, then it goes through its second of uh, the two pre-fires before the actual casting cycle. <clears throat> and again, you bring this up to temperature, and what you're looking for is uh, failures. You're looking, we'll go through a, uh, an inspection, we'll uh, look for, to see if something got loose or, or broke, or in, and uh, before we decide to go ahead and load the glass, why then, um, uh, you know, we cool it down and then we, we go to the next process, which is, which is loading, loading the glass. Steve, this is a very labor-intensive uh, procedure. How much time are we talking about here? Um, I had, uh, at one point I had, when I would quote mirrors, I would quote 30 months to make a mirror. They actually could, would take normally longer than that unless there was pressure, but about 30 months I think was about the best we could do. And that was, uh, um, you know, the casting process, the bold building process, which takes the better part of a year. 
It does take some time to uh, get all the glass. Uh, this is bought from Japan, from O'Hara. And when we place an order, they often start up uh, uh, these uh, satellite mom and pop shops that make the, they make the E6 in order to supply it. But we, we accumulate it in a warehouse. Uh, likewise, with the cores, all that stuff has to be shipped in and we do the machining, but the assembly of the mold takes the better part of 10 months. Uh, the casting cycle runs around three months, and I'll show you the things that happened afterwards. But the better part of three years, two and a half years, because you know, we do the back side, the front side, and, and all that sort of thing. So it's quite a while. Yes, it is very labor intensive. Um, highly skilled. Uh, most of these folks, many of the folks, I should say, uh, came to the lab as students and 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 hung on. <laughs> uh, they have a a, a, a really uh, a, a unique um, staff there. Uh, the rotation uh, rate of the mold uh, is about uh, seven RPM. Depends a little bit on a lot on the curvature that you're after for the LBT. It was about seven RPM. Um, and in this picture. You can see the lid from the top. And if you look closely, you can see these needle-like thermocouples. There's thermocouples everywhere. And they're plotted in this uh, software that's used to monitor this casting cycle. And what we really want is a very uniform uh, uh, heating. We don't want any hot spots or cold spots. We don't want any, any stress in here. Here you get an idea of what the casting cycle looks like. You reach high temp very quickly. And then there's a long period of cool annealing and then, and then cooling. Rotation does not have to occur once the stuff uh, solidifies again, but we usually rotate it slowly just to keep things uniform. Um, this picture, uh, I want to show you from the beginning. You see the glass melting in this picture, and you can see the marks in this shot right here. And a very important point is now, when it starts to go down, you want to know where it's going to stop, and we do, and make sure that it does stop there. Because um, if it doesn't stop, it's a signal that there's a leak or something like that. The oven pilot, uh, at one time, I'm told, before I got there, there was a smaller oven, and there was actually a, a chair on the oven which had some controls on it. And uh, I understand the person who was the oven pilot at the time actually rode in the chair. That had to be... <laughs> <laughs> it had to be unbelievably nauseating. But nowadays, the control room is separate. It's in the other, other uh, in the right next to the lab. You can look through a window. So all this is done from a stationary and relatively comfortable place. Okay, let's try. Like many, many leading technologies, it doesn't always go <clears throat> perfectly the first time. We found that out when they cast hail, when some of the cores um, came loose and the mirror was lost. Um, the second attempt was significantly more su uh, successful. Um, the bolts for this mirror were stainless steel and I don't quite understand why they melted because I checked the melting point of stainless and it's about a hundred and excuse me about 1400 to 1600 C and if the glass is melting at 1200 I don't know why the bolts lost. I can only imagine that maybe it got hotter than they thought but nevertheless they did recover, they made a second one, and you guys know what happened to that. In this case, we had a problem with the bands, and in, uh, we noticed that the glass didn't stop dropping when it should have, when it reached the line that we expected it to. We realized immediately that there was a leak, and so the remedial action is to lower the temperature uh, to solidify the glass. You don't want to lower it all the way because we weren't sure whether we had a usable mirror in there or not. And so we couldn't just pop the lid because the thing would have, of course, shattered. So we had to go through that last three months of uh, annealing and cooling to be able to open it up. And when we did, this is what we saw. You can see the tops of the cores are exposed here. And in, the, in, the, in this picture, you can see some of the glass is actually leaked out into the space between the tub and the furnace walls. Uh, turns out that not, this was not true all over the entire mirror. There was around a perhaps a two meter diameter section where the glass had dropped low enough uh, because of the viscosity, it didn't come all, all come out. And we had lost, we estimated about a ton of glass. Uh, and we recovered. We, we, we added some insulation all the way around and we added more glass on the top. We put the lid back on and we reheated only the top of the, of the glass. We 
uh, and and then it it and spun it as as we did before, and we were left with the concave surface that we were after. I would say that we didn't just do this immediately. Uh, the 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 way things work there was experiment, 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 and and not until you're sure that you know how things are going to behave do you proceed, and that's exactly what happened here. Um, we attributed the problem to friction in these bands. These bands, these ink and L bands, are designed to maintain the wrapping, the hoop uh, force on the tub, so that the thing doesn't explode under the hydrostatic pressure of the molten molten glass. However, in the, in the temperature range we work in, they, they lengthen by about a foot or so. Uh, and so they got to be uh, constantly pulled, and that's the purpose for the pneumatic uh, cylinders at each end. And somewhere, something hung up, and one or two of these tub sections moved a little bit and provided a space for some of the glass to come out. But as I said, uh, it, 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 it was a delay, but we, we actually did make the first mirror out of this. And here it is. And in this picture, you can actually see where we put the insulation, all blanketing insulation all the way around the top of, of, the, of the casting. And again, you can see the thermocouples in, in, in here. <clears throat> and so we were able to reheat and re uh, the top surface. Um, here's a picture of the tub wall partially disassembled. And you can see the bands, the Inconel bands, the way they wrap around. But we were leaving. Sorry? I'm sorry. I thought somebody was asking okay. a question. Here's a picture of the LBT1 after taking the furnace out. It's still oh, sitting okay. on the hearth. Uh, this is 8.4 meters across. Here's the crew. Uh, that's me. Um, I think this was. How do we get it out? Well, we, hello? We, we bond, we have a bonding fixture, a, a lifting fixture, which is bonded to the, to the surface at 36 locations, just like you see here. It's bonded to the top of the glass, the top of the mirror with silicon uh, RTV, uh, silicone uh, uh, adhesive. And when it cures and when it's finished, we quite literally picks, pick the mirror up from the hearth with a crane and lower it into uh, what we call the ring uh, for handling at that point. There's a, a long curing time. There's a lot of dummy bonds made at this time. There are, there are pads put on that are not attached to anything. And all of the purpose here, once again, is to make sure that it's okay to lift this baby up when, when we're ready to do that. So these things get pulled off at various times during the curing cycle and measured, uh, the, the adhesion is, is measured. Here you see uh, the lifting process starting right here. In this picture, you can see the bottom of the floor tiles. Uh, you can see they've separated perhaps an inch from the hearth. In this picture down here, we've raised it a little higher. Um, you can, uh, you can uh, when we're doing this, there's, a, there's a, a scale attached to the crane and we're reading it with binoculars so we can tell when we have the full load of the mirror on. At this point, I think the mirror is, the whole lift is around 40 tons. Here you can see it's raised up a little higher, and here you can see uh, the bottom of the mirror, and what comes up with it are all of the floor tiles because they are uh, they are uh, fixed to the cores inside. And here's a look at it. Uh, it gets placed into the into the ring, which is in this picture, and here's the lifting fixture, and here it's stood up on end um, because the first thing that has ha has to happen is we want to get those those floor tiles off. Here's another picture. Here we. Apparently they painted the ring <laughs> since I had the other picture, but here you can see the mirror is lifted up and it's hanging from the uh, crane. Here's the crane, here's the scale. Uh, here it is being lowered. These are the interfaces right here and here with the lifting fixture itself. And when, and, and the mirror, it's horizontal when we lay it in there, of course. And once we get it in there, we uh, bolt the, the, the six attachments at the outside edge and stand the thing up using the crane here vertical, fix it in place in preparation for uh, removing the hard refractories and um, the, the inner, inner material. In this picture, um, and this is done inside of a, an enclosure, which is uh, right here in this green box. This is a, 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 a lifting uh, crane. People work from here. But this plastic area is all enclosed. 
uh, and because inside there's a there's a, a platform that raises and lowers and inside the first thing that happens is all these silicon carbide refractory materials have to be removed we want to get rid of some of the weight because it's stressing the fixture we want to get as much of the mass off this thing as possible as quickly as possible and at that point they start washing out the the core material uh, which is done with water um, and it doesn't really dissolve the cores it breaks them up. It, uh, it's kind of like um, uh, sand, if you will. Um, the water just crumbles. You take, after you've taken the, the floor tiles off, the cores are exposed, and you got to shoot this gun in here and blast them out. And then you lower. You can see there's water in this thing. It fills up uh, to some extent until you get um, enough of the tiles out, then it will completely drain out. <clears throat> this, is, this takes a couple of weeks, um, and it's a, it's a fairly tedious job. So after you're done, you got this hollow mirror and it's cast, on a, uh, it's cast on all surfaces and it certainly isn't an optical component at that point. And in order to process the mirror from this point, we had a, a, a lot of different kinds of equipment. The first one is again, the log, large optical generator is made by Campbell Grinder in uh, Milwaukee. Um, it was originally owned by the Optical Sciences Center to manufacture the off-axis parabolic segments for radio telescopes. <clears throat> to machine the backside, and this mirror is on the backside, you can tell because the fixture is still bonded to the face, it sits on the spindle, and the backside gets uh, machined flat, uh, the outside diameter and inside diameter get machined, and um, um, we, we want to uh, polish it. When we, when we generate, we, have, we want accurate positioning, and, but we don't need a lot of power to move because we're not pushing anything around. When we're polishing, we have to go through a conversion process and the conversion process changes motors and encoders and we, uh, we then remove the Pope spindle and put this, what we call the stressed lap on, which is a 1.2 meter polishing pad, if you will, which moves uh, around on the surface, changes its shape as a function of the position on the mirror and maintains in contact with the with uh, with the polishing pads on the surface. Later on, as I showed in one of the earlier slides, we added a second machine. We call it the large polishing machine or original. It was made by a company also in Milwaukee, which was uh, called In Place Machining. They built machines to do on-site machining work for cases where you couldn't bring what it is you wanted to have machined to them. And so this machine was built. Uh, very similar to the other one. It consisted of a large gantry, but it was made to carry two laps because we, we could. We had no plans to do any generating on this machine, so it didn't have the high precision spindle and, and, and motion on it that, that this one does. We only had to know the position of the lap for this process uh, of polishing, you know, within about, uh, within an inch or so uh, in order to make it work. Here again, if you look carefully, okay, one more thing. We also decided at some point we wanted an, what we call an orbital polisher, which is a very small uh, polishing tool for localized work where we found the need to do that. Uh, what I wanted to point out here, here is the LSST mirror, if you haven't seen it. And if you look carefully, you can see that the central area of this machine, of this mirror, has a different curvature than the outer section, which is much flatter. So if you look at the design for this telescope, this is the primary mirror here, the secondary mirror will be up here somewhere, and then the tertiary mirror is actually this central area of the, of the mirror right there. Um, the stress lap is probably the most amazing thing I've ever seen in terms of <clears throat> optical fabrication. Uh, it, is, it, it produces extremely smooth surfaces because by virtue of its size and its application. Um, unlike, um, some of the uh, other automated polishing uh, and figuring technologies, it doesn't use a, a small tool with high degree of positioning. It uses a much larger tool, uh, which, is, which is really responsible for the very, very smooth, smooth surfaces. The rear surface gets done first, and of course it's loaded with the holes because that's where the, the, the cores came, and we can't deal with that. We have to plug them, otherwise, the mirror will fill with water and grit as we grind and polish it. As you can see in this picture right here, uh, this is just a flat aluminum disc. Uh, the mirror has been plugged. The, what we used were the 
plastic cups that you'll find on any construction site that they use to cover large conduit. It comes in various sizes. We bought them by the case. We stuffed them in the top hole and secured them with some RTV. And then we poured some more RTV in an attempt to get the surface as flush with uh, the, the glass as possible. Otherwise, it, you spent time sweeping the grit out in order to get anything polished. Why did we polish the mirror? Well, we, for a couple of reasons. It's the interface with the telescope cell. Uh, the backside of the mirror gets the load spreaders. These are triangular devices that are bonded to the back of the mirror and in the center of each one of them, there's an interface for the um, actuator that secures the mirror inside of the telescope cell during use. Um, and so we want a clean, flat surface for these. We also mark fairly accurately where these things go. This is a, a uh, LVDT and a, and a drill that is fixed to the Pope spindle. And so we put two marks, one for the center and one for a clocking mark to get the orientation right. And all that stuff gets done. These are the things that, that really add to the time. <clears throat> we can't do anything to the front surface of the mirror until this is done. The other reason is we wanna be able to look inside that glass. Uh, we wanna know if there's any fractures in there that may cause problems later on. Uh, you know, a fracture running when the mirror is in a lift could be catastrophic, it could be lethal. And so uh, we, after we polished the back surface and before we bonded the load spreaders on, we do an ex, uh, a fairly rigorous inspection, shooting a laser down through the ribs, and you're looking for that telltale scattered light where there's an indication that there may be a fracture. If we find them, we can, we can grind them, we can, uh, and, and we often did, um, and, and fix them. In some case, we would bond mirror, a bond uh, um, uh, UV cement uh, to fi fix the crack and, um, and move on. In order to do the front side, you got to flip the mirror over. And in this picture, you can see a mirror in mid flip uh, being in back, and we moved it to the back in, in, in the back of the, of the casting area again. There was no there was no crane service in the, um, in the polishing area with the exception of a small Gansrud crane that was used to lift uh, the, the lap on and off the mirror sometimes, uh, and uh, rather on, on and off the machine, and also the post spindle, and during the conversion process to pick up the heavy pieces of the machine that had to be put on to, um, uh, to fix the machine. The mirror is uh, sitting on all of these uh, actuators. There are pneumatic cylinders that are uh, inside the cell. And because we've got to be able to hold the thing rigidly uh, against and react against the polishing, the polishing forces. Uh, anybody that's has involved, any involvement in optics fab will wonder all, all immediately what happens when you polish over a, a honeycomb structure. Well, the answer is you're going to get quilting. That is the the face sheet will deflect under the force of the lap, which is roughly half a PSI. Uh, it deflects a tiny amount, but it does show up optically. And that we, add, we, we countered that by pressurizing the inside of the mirror uh, to the same polishing pressure, about a half a PSI. Uh, if you look at this, this is a six and a half meter cell. And you see these white tubes sticking up. These are PVC pipes. There's a, 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 a blower inside. And there's a seal that, that seals the outside diameter of the mirror and the inside diameter of the mirror so that when we're polishing, we're maintaining a pressure of half a PSI inside the mirror that is exactly equal to the average polishing pressure of the, of the lap itself. Um, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, earlier uh, the, the, the oh, I'm sorry, I forgot, the, the surface here gets machined with the Pope spindle to the uh, a, a parabolic surface. And, and then there has to be, and before, before we did the, before LPM, we had a log conversion, which added a couple of weeks to the, uh, to the whole process where we switched from the machining uh, stage, where here you see the, the parabolic surface being, being machined in, and to the polishing stage where you see the, the, lap, the lap on the surface. So here's a picture of the six, a 1.2 meter stress lap on the a log uh, polishing uh, uh, one of the mirrors. So that conversion like was right in the critical path and um, it really, it had a tendency to lengthen um, the whole uh, process. The stress lap works 
like a, um, a robot, if you will. The sub aperture section, the 1.2 meter, 48 inch diameter that the lap sits on of a off axis, if, if you're not on the center of this parabola, you're on an off axis section. The figure is dominated by astigmatism. Um, it's very asymmetric. Uh, and coma, and then there's some spherical aberration in it, and it changes dynamically. If you're, as you move this thing around here, you can imagine this thing is rotating like maybe a minute per RPM, uh, uh, one RPM, or maybe half RPM, depending upon what we're doing. The lap is rotating also, um, and uh, we want it, to, it needs to update as it moves around uh, from position to position in order to main, uh, maintain contact. <clears throat> the, the, the lap hangs. It hangs from three cables that are, wrapped around, uh, that are wrapped around motors, and that is the way we apply pressure. We can't push. We can only pull. So what happens is you rely on gravity to pull the lap down onto the mirrors and to control the amount of force down. You lift more or less on the three motors that the lap is hanging from interesting side effect of this is that we can lift differentially on those motors and we can apply a moment. So if we wanted to say, get some edge effort in by with the lap, we can lift up the other two side a little bit and cause the lap to have a localized effect at the, at the edge of, of the, um, uh, of, of the lap. We have to calibrate this. We can't measure the shape of the lap while it's in polishing. All we can do is measure the forces. In the, um, I'm going to, I'm going to attempt to back up a couple of slides here. Uh, this is a, a schematic of the lap. There, on this lap, there are 18 bender towers. Uh, each one is a, a, a can. You can it's red, white, and blue here. Inside each can is a motor that's attached to a pulley system, a linkage system. There is a stainless steel band wrapped around here, and it's fixed to a, uh, a can on the other side. In that, somewhere in that uh, link is a force sensor, a load cell. So when it's running, we can measure the forces. Um, and so when you're polishing, you want to have the lap be the shape that you want the mirror to be at the position that the lap is. And the only way you know that's true is that you've applied the forces that are required to do that. And how do you know what they are? Well, we have a calibration setup. We call it the bed of nails. I don't have a picture of it here, except it's right there in this picture. And it's as big as the lap, and you, we would move the lap over it and lower the thing on there. You would command it to take a shape, and then the LVDTs would would give you a rather digitized shape of the lap. And that was pretty much all you had. You had to go on faith from that point that the, um, that the shape of the lap was as you wanted it to be. And the proof is in the pudding. I mean, you didn't know it until you, until you, uh, you, know, you tested uh, to see the effect. We had several ways of uh, predicting uh, the uh, removal profile, some software that we had written for symmetric errors, we were able to control the relative rotation rate of the lap, the direction of the rotation rate of the lap, whether we were cog wheeling, that is where there was zero relative rotation and therefore zero material removal at a spot. All those degrees of freedom were available to us to try and uh, fix the measured profile of the surface. So similarly, for uh, non-axisymmetric errors like astigmatism or coma or any or bumps or lumps that were not rotationally symmetric errors on the surface, we had a, a few other tools in, in, our, in our box. One of them was to literally modulate the pressure of the lap as a function of rotation. So if you had astigmatism, which looks like potato chip where two lobes are uh, uh, high and two lobes are low, let's say, you could lift the mirror at the low spots. By lifting, you don't actually leave the surface, but you remove, remove some of the force by jacking up on the, the three lifting uh, motors and let it fall on the high spots. And it was amazingly um, uh, effective um, uh, at, at reducing axisymmetric errors, non-axisymmetric errors. 
in, in, in this process. Uh, the uh, um, rate of uh, convergence was extremely high in grinding uh, and it tapered off, and I'll show you that in a slide later on in polishing. When you got closer and closer to the desired surface, uh, things that began to happen sub substantially more slowly. I can't go without mentioning bubbles. <laughs> Bubbles were a, a problem, um, and that is one of the reasons that the mirror was made with the glass that it was being made with. The E6 glass of O'Hara has exactly the same chemistry as the Pyrex glass, and it also has the same chemistry as the shot um, uh, Boraflote glass. Shots, um, Shots Pyrex, or Boraflote as they called it, was a borosilicate material that was made by the float process. And, and um, it wasn't suitable for what we were doing here because we wanted it, it was touched by tin, if you will, on the float process. It had contaminants on it. Pyrex was the same deal. Pyrex was made in what I call a taffy pulling process where it was uh, squeezed out of a, of a layer uh, in, in a ribbon that was around uh, a meter wide and uh, maybe four, four uh, uh, 100 millimeters thick, and then it would be machined. And then in order to make big ones, you had to, again, fuse it together, uh, much like you did the ULE. The E6 was made in crucibles, um, and, and they were, it was mixed. And so the constituents were mixed up in, in accurate proportions, put into a crucible, and it was melted and stirred during that time. And when it was finished, it was cooled inside the crucible, the crucible was sacrificed, that, was, that is, it was broken up in order to extract it, and the, and the glass that was in contact with the crucible walls was discarded. Uh, because anything that's a contaminate in the glass, when you reach 1200 C, starts to foam, starts to bubble. And it's like the bubbles in the glass of beer, they just come from no apparent location and start and continue to rise. And so, we, they don't stop after a while. The uh, earlier assumptions was, oh, if you just keep it hot enough, the bubbles will burst through the surface and we'll be done with them. Well, that wasn't the case. And MMT, uh, as you, well, it wasn't an MMT. This was probably Magellan here. You can see the bubbles had a nasty effect that was showing up in polishing. And uh, we, we went through a lot of pain and suffering to get rid of this. Uh, the, most of it was maintenance. Uh, we would stop polishing for uh, periods and uh, go through the look for bubbles. We would use toothpicks to clean out the garbage, take a small stone and bevel them. In extreme cases where we had large bubbles and we would, we would open up the hole and put a glass plug in, bond it in with UV cement and, and that would become part of the surface. That of course was all done before the mirror was machined on the front side. You wouldn't want to do this uh, when, you were, uh, when you were already into polishing. I should point out in this picture, and you could see it in one of the other pictures, this is what we call the air cart. It was a hovercraft, and I will once again attempt to, um, okay, here's a better picture of it. <coughs> it was a U-shaped tool that straddled the, the, the spindle in the, uh, on the log and picked up the mirror. At the four corners were um, hover, I call them air bladders. Air was forced in. You can see a hose going here. You can see it better in, um, oh, I'm going the wrong way. This picture, this hose right here, there was a tractor attached to it. And, and in the picture earlier, uh, you could control the location. So really, in order to move this thing around, we couldn't test the mirror when it was sitting on the polishing machine because the test tower was over here and the entire area of the floor was on isolation supports. So we had to lift it from the polisher and back it out over the polishing, over the test tower in order to measure uh, the surface using, um, using interferometry. Testing was done this way. Uh, we moved the position, moved the mirror into position. Here's a cartoon of the test tower. This is the mirror lab floor. This is concrete apron. This is hollow. These are walls. You can't see in this picture, but they're roughly two feet wide. These are concrete pillars. Here's one of them here, and here's one of them here. The air cart is shown here, the mirror here, and here's the test tower structure built over top of it. This entire structure sits on 
one, two, and on the back, three air supports, it floats. So when you're measuring infrometrically, it is isolated to reduce the vibration. It was pretty cool. The, the secondary mirror, excuse me, the, the null lens uh, was held in place in this case up here with the pos positioner that was later to be used in an LBT to hold the secondary mirrors in place. It's a hexapod. There are six actuators, one for each degree of freedom, and you can move this thing in any way you want. Um, this picture, I'm fairly certain, is showing the infrared null lens. We, at two stages, at two at early stages when we're grinding uh, the surface of the mirror with loose abrasive and the stress slap, we measure the surface at 10 microns. And so we can get interference fringes from a ground surface. Later, we, when we get to the polishing stage, we want greater accuracy and we have a polished surface. So we have a second null lens. Uh, and it operates at uh, 0.6 uh, uh, microns, Heaney laser uh, light. <clears throat> and so that's the way the mirror was, was measured. Here's a very early picture, you can tell by the monitor, of, uh, of uh, Dean measuring one of the mirror surfaces. You can see a three-load pattern in this, in this figure right here. This is something that we would have jumped on uh, with the stress lab. What was the specification of these mirrors? The specification was stated something like, we don't want any degradation of the image that's capable at the site. And there's, there's all manner of publications on how this is calculated, but it, and, and we measured it with some software that we had uh, uh, used uh, at the lab. And essentially what it is, is a, it is a relationship between the surface error and the spatial scale. Um, certain errors of large spatial scale were allowed some, uh, where some errors were not. In this particular plot, I'm showing the RMS function as a uh, structure function as a function of date. Backgrounds that you get the zoom. Yeah. Sorry. Um, <laughs> the, these, this is, uh, this is, these traces are, show the mirror figure. Um, as a function of the date, you know, so it's, it's telling us it, it, the convergence is moving um, Coffee cup. <laughs> to the right. Low order errors, uh, we, we, could, we, could, we could deal with, with the active support. Um, the mirror is going to change its shape uh, as it moves around on the sky. And so some of that <coughs> is compensated for with the, with the, with the system in, uh, in the telescope. It was also uh, with the system in the polishing cell. So we could simulate what the telescope, what the mirror was going to look like uh, when it was in the polishing, uh, rather, when it was in the telescope, telescope cell. Here's a, an example of one of the, this may be the, the last one, I don't remember, but uh, you can see this is, the, this is a plot of the, the RMS error of, in figure in, in microns. And you can see in the beginning, which is, looks like uh, January 02, it was 40 some microns. Um, it dropped very quickly as we began uh, grinding. And eventually when we moved into the visible, the, at the end of the day, the convergence rate dropped dramatically to about 3%. When I say that, what I'm saying is that with every iteration of polishing uh, and testing, we were able to remove or reduce the error by about 3% with each iteration. So in this case, um, <clears throat> without looking at the flexible modes, we finished at about 37 nanometers, nanometers RMS. And you can clearly see a, a tri-low pattern in here, but here's the same mirror when we eliminate that tri-low pattern by using the, the mirror support systems in the polishing cell, the error drops 10 nanometers to 21 nanometers RMS, which I'm pretty sure is the way, I'm pretty sure that's the way it was finished. I don't, that was 20 years ago. Uh, here's a plot uh, of the last part of uh, convergence. This is basically the, the last uh, few, let's see, this is in uh, April, April, and so here in this picture, that was somewhere around in this vicinity right here. So this is a, a view of this same graph at a different scale. <clears throat> here I remember there was a big issue. We had, suddenly we realized that we had a mistake somewhere and we, uh, we were getting, we were removing spherical aberration where we shouldn't have been, calibrating it out where we should not have been. 
And when we made up for that, bingo, you can see uh, the error jumped and we had to uh, resume. So uh, we, once again, we, we compensated for that problem and, and gradually fixed it. Uh, here's the conversion, convergence rate uh, during this period. And you can see uh, also it gets to the point where it just, it doesn't get any better. And that's for a, a lot of reasons, not the least of which is your ability to test the mirror. Uh, when you're testing at levels like this, everything is noise. Your, your signal is so small that you have to test and test. We've test for days before we would actually decide to believe what we were seeing uh, and rub accordingly, uh, rub accordingly to that. At some point, we were, <laughs> it was taking too long. <laughs> so we started hitting some of the spots by hand. And um, I did this by overlaying the, the drawing of the core structure and scaling it and orient it to the mirror so that we could use the cores to identify where to rub. And we actually did this uh, by hand. We made small tools and we rubbed on the high spots as shown by these numbered, numbered cores. And, and then you would follow that with a stress lap run to smooth things out. This is basic optical fabrication 101 on a large, on a large scale. Um, then we're done. We pull the mirror out of the polishing cell. We do that. We've got an optical surface now. We don't want to mess it up. So we cover the surface with uh, uh, optic coat which is a removable uh, skin that sprays on, highly volatile, nasty on the liver. Uh, it's got a lot of toluene in it. We do this in an open area. But it allows us to pick up the mirror, this time not by bonding, but by using vacuum. And in this picture, you see the same lifting fixture that was used before, where the, the pads that were bonded on previously have been replaced by uh, 20 inch diameter uh, rubber suction cups and uh, one, two, three, four, five, six pumps. We have trayfold redundancy, that is, <clears throat> we can lose three pumps and still hold the mirror. The, the pumps don't handle segments, the pumps pump uh, cups all over the mirror so that if one of them goes out, the thing doesn't fall onto one side. Here we show the mirror hanging from the suction cups with the load spreaders on the bottom uh, and two crazies standing under it. We never did that again. <laughs> and here you see it being lift, lowered into the LBT cell. Here's a picture of it. <clears throat> in the LBT cell, in the testing lab, we were able to measure the mirror in the cell. Here you can see it's sitting between the legs of the, of the test tower. And in this picture, you can see it's being hauled up the Mount Graham in, in Safford, Arizona, which at about 10,000 feet, roughly uh, around 80 miles east of, of Tucson. And here's the LBT on Mount Graham. This is what it looks like. Here's the building. Uh, I took this picture when I visit, visit, oops, visited there once, and I actually was able to go to the top, which is something like 160 feet off the forest floor. And I took this picture. And this is the Vatican 1.8 meter uh, telescope right here. Um, and here's a picture of the, um, here's a picture of the two mirrors. Uh, I did not take this picture. Uh, in, mounted on the, on the support um, in the way it is right now. And that is it. Does anybody have any questions? Hey, Steve, uh -huh. when I visited the mirror lab, well, one, I saw some CNC, CNC machines that they showed us that had a much smaller grinding surface, more like a, like a steel grinder. But I wasn't quite sure what they, they used it for. I got the impression it was for the surface of the mirror. But the other thing was, they said at the time that the 8.4 meter mirror size was dictated by the structural supports of the building itself. So they made all the tools to conform with the fact they couldn't take a mirror any larger than that out. Is that really true or is it really based on the homogeneous material itself? No, I think that's probably true. And it's not only the building. Uh, the, the, there was also the issue of getting it from A to B on the surface of the planet. 
uh, you can only you know you can only haul things of a certain size over the roads. Um, uh, in that earlier picture I showed, you can see the Subaru mirror. You know, it's got the wide load. So yes, it was very much it, the log. I'm sure had something to do with it. They when they first started planning for this, they did not have the LPM, so the log, the uh, the large optical generator already existed, and so there was a limit to the size of the mirror that would slide underneath that thing. The machines that you saw, do you remember what year you were there? Probably about five years ago. Okay, so um, they would have had the LPM there, which was the big blue machine, which had two spindles on it. But in the casting lab, they had a CNC machine, a Fadal machine, and that was used strictly to machine the cores. Ah. Um, uh, there was also a the secondary polishing machine, by that time would have been moved to probably the Optical Sciences Center. At one time when we put the LPM in, we were making them, we were still making the uh, 1.7 meter secondary for the uh, F5 secondary for the MMT telescope, a convex hyperboloid. That was out of zero door, by the way. Um, and we had to move that machine and we moved it to the, uh, to, uh, the lab at uh, National Observatory, right up Cherry Avenue, right up the street from us, NOAO. They had a room that they allowed us to move the machine into and we carried on. We made the secondary mirrors for the large binocular telescope in that building. Since that time, I, since I've gone, I think it's been moved again. I'm pretty sure that it has been moved to optical sciences uh, over there. And the, the guy that ran that machine most of the time, Brian Smith, is, has retired. Um, Steve, I have a question, please. Yes. I was at the lab several years ago. They were doing the final polish on the LSST. Yeah. It incorporated a technician standing on the mirror with something that looked like a mop and a bucket of material that looked rouge-like that he was spreading over the mirror as part of the final processing step. What was happening there? Well, <clears throat> that's a good question <laughs> because Except for the picture that I showed where uh, the fellow, his name was John Ray, he was brushing the grit into the holes. That was an extreme case because, you know, we could never get the back, the holes to be perfectly flush with the surface. And so we were always having to pull up the, uh, the grit from the backside. And so that's the one and only time that I can remember ever having anyone standing on the mirror when the polishing was actually occurring. For the front surface of the mirror, you don't have the holes to deal with. And we delivered, we delivered the polish uh, through a pump uh, and a hose and a, and a kind of an outrigger that hung over the surface. Mm. And it literally dripped onto the surface uh, until, until it came under the lap. Now, why they would have somebody uh, standing on the mirror uh, may have had something to do uh, uh, with the fact that that was, you know, that was a much more, uh, uh, um, concave surface, deeper surface than the rest of the mirror was. Um, I don't, I don't, I really can't answer the question. That's the only reason I can think of. For one reason or another, they weren't getting the, the rouge to where they wanted it. Okay. And, uh, more, more often, the rouge would normally have occurred, been used near the end of polishing. Um, during the, um, during the beginning of polishing, we were using um, cerium oxide. And we were also using polyurethane pads that were put over pitch squares that that was that was our remedy for the bubble problem they the the pitch po pitch pads in polishing wreaked havoc when they would pass over a hole and the the my theory uh, was that the pitch would squeeze a little bit into the hole as the lap was moving over it there would be a tiny lump in the pitch i'm talking really tiny as the lap moved and a bump hit the edge of the hole, it would wear the edge and it would increase the size of the defect a lot. <coughs> Excuse me. So cerium oxide is also uh, dark, is, is also brown, uh, or some people say orange or tan. The rouge is somewhat darker, but we were unable to get, we wanted, a, uh, we wanted at least a 20 angstrom RMS surface polish on the surface and we were not able to achieve that with the pads and, and serum oxide, although we were able to figure the mirror very well without aggravating the, any bubbles. At the end of the day, we managed, we wanted to put in several tens, my recollection was maybe, 40, maybe a week's worth of polishing with rouge, milled rouge, we, we tumbled it uh, in the lab, 
<clears throat> and applied it. And that got us below 20 angstrom RMS surface. It was very slow though. It would, the figure would not respond, which was a good thing because at that point we had to figure more or less where we wanted it. And we just wanted to clean up <clears throat> the roughness of the surface. Steve, Steve, how did you get into this business? What's your, what did you train to be? <laughs> I, as a small child, I developed this nasty habit. Three days a week, uh, three days, three hours, excuse me, three times a day I had to eat. So I had to find a job that, that supported me. I became interested in telescope making at, in 1972. I built my first scope there. And after that, I, uh, I went to work uh, in Pittsburgh where they were making, well, of many, of, among other things, they, they hadn't met me, the Subaru. I wasn't there. I had left just before the Subaru secondary got there, a mere primary got there. But I was involved in building the, the, the uh, polishing facility in Wampum Mine. Uh, I went to Germany to pick out a, a CNC machine, which we use for that process, which still resides in the mine, as far as I know. Uh, but I went originally to school for biology. Uh -huh. um, by, the, by the second year, I had become um, completely smitten with optics and telescope making. More telescope making than astronomy. I was more interested in how to make the instruments than I was in using them. Um, and then I, but I, while I was working, I worked for 17 years at Contravis in Pittsburgh. And during that time, I, I got a, a graduate degree in math. And I, then I went to uh, Tucson because they, they had an opening. One of their key people decided to retire and um, they were looking for somebody. Um, I knew a little bit about them. Somebody gave them my name and I got a call and I went there. And then I left there after 12 years. Um, so it's, it's all about making stuff. <laughs> That's what it's about. Another question, please. You mentioned that it took two and a half or three years from beginning to end to complete a mirror. Is, can you overlap the production? Can you be working at different stages on two mirrors at the same time, for example? Absolutely, absolutely, yes. And that was the reason, that was the reason, to, first of all, for enlarging the building facility, and secondly, for adding the second mirror. Because, you know, before, as I mentioned, when we only had the log to worry, work with, we had to convert it from a poly, from a grinder to a polisher, and that was right smack in the critical path. And so we couldn't we, we couldn't tolerate that. When we started negotiating with uh, Magellan uh, with Carnegie for the uh, giant Magellan telescope, you know they were looking for uh, uh, a, a very tight schedule, which of course has long come and gone. But at the time, I remember at the time they were asking for us to produce all those mirrors. All, there are seven mirrors. There are six off-axis parabolic segments and one central rotationally symmetric segment that does have a hole in it for a giant Magellan. And they wanted those mirrors all delivered by 2014. <laughs> and we were looking at ways to do that. And you know, we, I think I, I finally came up, showed them a way to do that, but it, it really required a serious upgrade to the surface. So yes, there was mold building going on at one end or maybe casting. At the same time, there could be generating on the log, and there could be polishing happening on the mirror. So yes, when the the end, we didn't have to, you know, um, run each project end to end. We we were able to stagger them, as you say, uh, once we had the equipment in place to be able to work on different stages at different times. At the same time, rather, excuse me, different mirrors at the same time. Hey, Steve, uh, two questions. Number one is. I think you implied that if you're going to make a big mirror out of Zerador, for example, like the four meter secondary for ESO ZLT, maybe it wouldn't be honeycombed like you had honeycombed the uh, borosilicate. And the other is, is it significantly different to polish a borosilicate mirror versus a fused silica mirror versus a Zerador or some other comment? Nice. Yeah, my experience is that Zerador is very <clears throat> forgiving. Uh, we, everybody, every optician that I ever knew enjoyed working Zerador. Um, ULE was a little harder, but both the Zerador and ULE were nice because they didn't change with temperature, which also mm -hmm. made the opticians happy. Um, uh, the borosilicate mirror was um, uh, not as hard as the um, 
um, as the ULE, but it was, it was a little bit harder. So the, the, the difference was small. Lightweighting zero door, in my experience, is never done th this way. The, as I mentioned earlier, the F5 secondary for the multiple mirror telescope was a 1.7 meter convex hyperbola. It was lightweighted, but it was done by machining. That is, they hollowed it out with diamond tools. And um, that, was, uh, also, that was also done on uh, Subaru. They didn't honeycomb that mirror, <clears throat> but the, 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 the Subaru mirrors and the VLT, that is the zero door eight meter and the, the Corning eight meter mirrors were all what I would call thin meniscus mirrors. They were, they were curved on both sides. They had a more or less constant thickness of about 200, 200 millimeters, but the actuators were attached to the back into holes that were machined uh, roughly halfway into the substrate. So again, that was all done by, by diamond machining with diamond tools. I don't know any, any case where um, zero door was poured into a mold uh, like, like the ULE, or excuse me, like the, uh, the Pyrex or the E6 uh, was done. Uh, that's remeltable. The zero door, once it's ceramized, you, you, you can't remelt it. It's, it's pretty much fixed. <clears throat> Hey, Steve, I could ask you questions all day, but one would be how many places in the world can you do this type of fabrication? Uh, Tucson, Arizona only. There is, it is unique on the planet. There is no place else that makes it from raw material to integrated with the cell, the mirror cell. <clears throat> yeah, um, they don't, first of all, uh, shot disassembled their Mainz facility for the large mirrors after the VLT was finished. They still make glass, uh, uh, zero door, that's four meters. Uh, uh, when I was with Contravis, we built a four meter, 3.67 is the AEOS primary mirror that where it went on to the top of Haleakala, the Air Force Maui optical site. Um, um, I'm trying to, there, there, there were there's similar mirrors, four meter. They're, they still make, I think they still make um, four meter um, ULE mirrors. Uh, the SOAR mirror was, was one and there were, some others, I can't remember exactly what they were, but as far as the, from beginning to end, uh, this is the only place that you'll do it. Steve, you said some of the light weighting was done by machining. So if you're machining out the back of a mirror after you've already figured the surface, does that change the stress and change the surface in some way? Yes. Yes, it does. Now, we didn't machine any of the big mirrors. Uh, uh, that was all done by the molding process, mm -hmm. the casting process. <clears throat> but I have a, a lot of experience in light weighting uh, machine, uh, zero door ULE Pyrex substrates and watching the figure change. And the way that is generally uh, remedied is to acid etch. The change occurs from the fracturing that happens when you machine the glass with a diamond tool. If you can imagine the tool, the kinetic energy of that tiny diamond hitting that glass, it fractures it. <coughs> and there's some stress built up as a result of that fracturing. If you etch it, and there are a number of ways to do it, but most of it, 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 it involves hydrofluoric acid. Um, it can also be done by polishing, but that's impractical for a lightweighted substrate. However, I have made optics where we figure it, we lightweight it, then we acid etched it, and then most of the time the acid etching was enough to restore the figure of the mirror. In some cases, it was necessary to touch up the figure a little bit. But yes, it does. It absolutely does change. We were making off-axis uh, parabolas, small ones. They were only six inches in diameter one time. <clears throat> this was in Pittsburgh. But <clears throat> we made a large, I was around a 24-inch diameter substrate that was a parabola, and we got uh, a six-inch core drill, and we cored off-axis segments out of them. Of course, we had interferograms of the surface that showed we had a nice parabola on there, but then we took pictures of the, the cutout segments and all of them had a raised edge, all of them, all the way around. And we knew immediately that that was caused by the stress induced by machining. So that was a, that was a real lesson right there. Uh, I covered the surfaces with beeswax uh, so that they, because they were polished on both sides. The spherical surface this was actually a, a mirror and a lens because uh, one side was parabolic, the other side was spherical. And it was made out of, um, um, it was not, it was some other glass, I can't recall. Uh, anyway, 
we etched the outside. I dunked the mirrors in hydrofluoric acid and for X amount of time, I used a little sample piece to determine how much I had removed, pulled them out, <clears throat> measured them, and we had been able to recover the surface. And this is all about the, the stress that comes from, from the, uh, the grinding process. Thanks. Well, we're, we're, we're going on about almost an hour and a half. Okay. Steve, thank you very much. Thanks for having me. I'm glad everybody's interested. <laughs> and Andy, thank you. Thank you for the update. I really appreciate it. Let me let me throw out one, you know, one more one more request for questions. And uh, let's take, you know, another question, another two questions, and then uh, we'll uh, we'll we'll adjourn the meeting. Are there any other questions? Uh, yeah, I have actually. I have two questions. Uh, uh, how, how do you ship the mirrors overseas? I, I assume you had to take them to a ship somewhere. Uh, where is that? Where do you take the mirrors? Um, well, none of these mirrors have gone overseas. Well, South America. <clears throat> well, yeah, not the. Well, that was yeah. They it's by ship for sure. But the the Corning mirror from for Subaru came by barge in and then down the highway. The LBT. Well, I, I take that back. I shouldn't have said that. Since I've been gone, yes, some of the mirrors have gone overseas. I guess LSST is someplace in South America. It must have gone over by ship. Well, I, I was curious what which port do they go out of? Uh, good question. Don't know. Okay. Uh, also. Uh, uh, I have a friend here in Anza who, uh, he, he makes mirrors, uh, amateur telescope mirrors. Uh, I think he can do up to uh, 30 inches or so. Mm -hmm. And uh, within the business, he is well known and he has a, a high reputation. Uh, we have occasional power outages up here. And when there's a power outage, he has to ru rush over to his polishing machines and separate the, uh, the uh, lap from the mirror. Yeah. So, so that it doesn't get dried on the mirror. Did, uh, uh, did you have problems with uh, power outages or uh, do you have your own power supply or what? Uh, I, I don't remember ever having a problem with power outages. We use electricity to melt the glass. That, that, that we do have backup generators for that. We brought them in for that purpose because we would not, we did not want to lose power in the middle of the casting cycle. You could quite conceivably lose the mirror. But while, you know, uh, for all other operations, uh, we just survived off of the Tucson power. Uh, but yes, if, you know, I, I can understand that. We, you know, I've had that problem in any place I've worked where you got a big lap on a, on a mirror surface. <clears throat> if you lose power, uh, you know, and it stops rotating, uh, you're in such intimate contact with the surface that you'll, it, it'll stick, the, the lap will stick. And you want to get it off there if you can. Geez, what's your annual power bill anyway? <laughs> it must be a lot of electricity. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, it was it was pretty high. Yeah, and you know what? It always seemed to me. Get this. It always seemed to me that the castings occurred in August in Tucson. If you ever <laughs> been in Tucson, yes, I August, have. <laughs> it can't get much hotter, but it was definitely hotter in the in the casting lab. I, it, I think the forecast for today for Tucson was one twelve. Yeah, I believe it. Yeah, yeah. Well, with that. Again, Steve, that was that was great. Thank, Thank you, you very much. I guess I'd like to close down the meeting now. Thank everybody who attended. And next time, uh, July twenty Saturday, July twenty fifth, Rob Zellum will be talking about exoplanets, finding life in the galaxy. <laughs> and exploring the atmospheres of exoplanets with a device, with an instrument called Nessie, which he will explain to us. With that, thank you all very much, and we'll see you in two weeks. Hey, see ya. Thank, thank you. Steve. Thank you. Both Steves. Both Steves. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>